Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you all for joining us. Today's webinar, Chemical Resistance and Fluid Management Systems, is brought to you by the Eastman Chemical Company. Your presenters today are Dr. Steve Gibbons and Cynthia Lewis. Just a brief background on some of our presenters today. Cynthia Lewis is the Market Insight and Strategy Manager at Eastman Chemical Company, located in Kingsport, Tennessee. Lewis is responsible for providing market insights and strategy for the medical portfolio of Eastman Specialty Plastics business. Lewis graduated from the University of Texas at Arlington with an MBA with emphasis in marketing and a master's degree in market research. Joining Cynthia is Dr. Steve Gibbons. Dr. Gibbons is a senior polymer application scientist for Eastman Chemical Company. He's responsible for new application development, market-focused product research, and product performance for the Eastman Triton co-polyester. During his career, Givens has been actively involved with the American Chemical Society and the Materials Research Society. He holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Virginia's College at Wise and doctor of philosophy degree in material science and engineering from the University of Delaware. My name is Trey McDonald with UL, and I'll be moderating today's event. Please send us your questions by typing them in the question box located on your screen. Our panelists will answer them at the end of the presentation. We are recording today's event and we'll send you a link by email when the slides and video have been posted to the UL Prospector Knowledge Center. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Cynthia. Cynthia? Thank you. Eastman has been providing chemical polymer solutions to the medical industry for more than 65 years. We have approximately 15,000 employees in more than 50 manufacturing sites around the world. Eastman is a perennial Energy Star partner and was recognized with Ethospheres SS, SS, 2015 World's Most, Most Ethical Companies Award for the third year in a row. Our copolyesters, especially Eastman Triton copolyester, help device manufacturers keep pace with changing industry needs and medical advances. One current example is the critical need for the next generation of infusion and blood contact devices that need a higher level of chemical resistance. In addition to compatibility with lipids and other body fluids, two factors place a higher value on chemical resistance in fluid management components. One is the increased use of aggressive disinfectants and disinfectant wipes um, to prevent healthcare associated infections or HAIs. The other is the increasing importance of oncology therapies, including both the pharmaceutical compounds and the carrier solvents that help make these drugs effective. The webinar content, the, our webinar content today will uh, um, focus on the pressures exerted on these medical devices, focusing most on healthcare acquired infections and the resulting use of aggressive disinfectants. Then we'll look at the rising need for chemical resistance in both clear and opaque devices. We will look at sources of chemical attack driving this need. We will review changes in international standards that may require new product development in fluid management. And we will share testing protocols designed to predict polymer performance in challenging chemical attack conditions. And then finally, you'll have time for your questions. Today's medical devices must measure up to many standards, with patient safety always being the ultimate goal. Medical devices do more for caregivers and patients with each innovation in medical and polymer science. They do more, look better, and are easier to use. As a result, devices are more portable and come in contact with more people, often operated by patients as well as professionals. In addition to constant handling, the devices must withstand frequent use of aggressive disinfectants, disinfecting wipes, and sterilization as part of the increased emphasis on preventing healthcare acquired infections. Many devices also must withstand powerful cancer and oncology drugs and their carrier solvents. The life of medical devices is being shortened and the performance compromised by all of these external forces and increasing cost pressures. Devices must provide all of these capabilities cost effectively, delivering safe and effective performance throughout the expected life of the specific device. In addition to disinfectants putting pressure on the outside of devices and drugs and carrier solvents attacking from within, manufacturing processes, including solvent bonding processes, 
can erode the mechanical inte integrity of, of plastics. Meanwhile, international standards for small bore connectors are changing across all fluid management platforms. The ISO standard 80369 continues to move toward final approval and publishing and will ultimately apply to all delivery platforms. Interval feeding applications are published and the FDA in the U.S. has adopted these standards last year. Neuraxial standards will be available soon along with those for IV components. Our first module today looks at the rise of aggressive disinfecting protocols. Especially in North America, healthcare systems are focusing on redu reducing hospital acquired infections. Environmental disinfecting is especially important because the organisms can live on dry surfaces from two hours to 46 months depending on the pathogen. This table shows the survival rates of hospital pathogens including the two common superbugs on dry hospital surfaces. Bleach does a great job of killing these microbes. Therefore, one of the major changes in hospitals uh, made in the past five years is the widespread use of products containing bleach. All hard surfaces are wiped down with bleach, which is hard on equipment, and bleach leaves a residue which patients perceive as dirty, so a second product is often used to remove this residue. The end result is a shortening life cycle of surface equipment, and many device housings experience environmental stress cracking and can prematurely fail. Because of, because of clinical evidence, um, isopropyl alcohol and chlorhexidine are now dominating the market, and wet isopropyl alcohol alone is a pervasively wiped on clinicians' hands, on patients' skin, and is sometimes even contained in devices. Because of these practices, HAIs, HAI rates, the infection rates for catheter-associated infections are falling significantly. However, these protocols subject the devices to significantly higher levels of chemical attack. Disposable catheter hugs, hubs, connectors, and Y sites visibly crack and this causes clinicians to doubt their safety and quality. Devices designed five or ten years ago are experiencing performance and functional issues. Sometimes after a few minutes of active use for disposables or a few months in the case of reusable monitors and portable imaging equipment. Because of this, device designers and manufacturers are looking for materials that perform better in this new use environment. In addition to chemical attack from the outside, fluid management components face persistent attack from fluids they carry, specifically drugs and carrier solvents. Here is a list of some of the drugs, carrier solvents and disinfectants, frequently mentioned by our medical device customers. Of these, the ones that are causing the most issues are in the oncology space, closely followed by pain medication and some anesthesia drugs. This chart shows that oncology drugs, the leading cause of chemical attack in delivery devices, it's a growing segment in healthcare. This growth is expected to continue on the five-year horizon. Oncology drug usage is the highest in the U.S., where it accounts for 42% of all drug spend, and second highest in Europe, with 26% spend. And a majority of these drugs are, inter are uh, administered interven intravenously. An emerging trend in cancer drug treatment is the incompatibility of newer drugs and their carrier solvents with the polymers and traditionally used delivery systems. New oncology preparations may include carrier solvents such as dimethyl acetamide dimethyl acetamide, or dimethyl suffoxide. These solvents can degrade the performance of drug delivery systems. A recent example of this incompatibility generated this FDA safety notification issued in February of 2015. Here the Institute for Safe Medication Practices recommends that healthcare professionals stop using trianda injection in closed system transfer devices or vial adapters and syringes 
containing poly, polycarbonate or acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, which is more commonly called ABS. This specific FDA warning generated a significant amount of healthcare industry press as clinicians identified the specific lists of devices that can and should not be used with Trianda, also known as minimustine hydrochloride. In addition to Trianda, the FDA also identified amsacrine and busulfan as other agents that when, dilute, when diluted with DMAC can melt or dissolve the PC or ABS found in closed system transfer devices. The FDA went on to require labeling changes for these compounds in order to more clearly warn clinicians to be careful in their drug delivery uh, device choices. The links provided here take you to the specific FDA safety alert and to pharmacy practice news sources for lists of compatible and incompatible devices. The pharmacy practice news website requires registration for entry. The potential results of this drug device incompatibility can be serious, including potential drug product contamination, leaking product causing potential health consequences for practitioners, and potential serious adverse consequences to the patients if dissolved PC or ABS enter the patient's vascular system. Now, now we'll turn to the sources of chemical attack in the fabrication process. The manufacturing processes themselves can introduce chemical attack. Bonding solvents and adhesives can degrade some legacy polymers. So can the plasticizers commonly used in flexible PVC parts. It's important to examine polymer performance in light of these conditions. In solvent bonding of lures and connectors to tubing, for example, triton copolyesters stand up to the solvents without cracking or crazing, and for the bonds formed, the tubing snaps before the bond fails. Some brand owners find this, this level of performance very useful. And finally, global standards for all small bore connectors are undergoing changes to improve patient safety. Many companies are making plans to modify parts in order to comply with these new standards. The standards are being published as ISO 80369. They will eventually impact all categories of fluid management, small bore connectors. In the U.S., the standards are adopted as AAMI CN3 PS 2014. And as mentioned recently, these were added by the FDA as performance standards to be addressed in future interval feeding application 510K applications. The FDA has published overall standards and test methods for this entire group of uh, connectors in the Federal Register, signaling its, in, its intent to adopt them in the future. Key to this standard is a shift to semi-rigid and rigid materials moving away from flexible materials that can appropriately force fit together across applications. Another way the standard addresses incompat incompatibility across application platforms is to assign specific bore diameter ranges to specific applications. An example of this concept is shown in this graph. Under this plan, it will be impossible to fit gas delivery applications into venous delivery systems, for example. For the next segment of information, we will hear from Dr. Steve Gibbons who is our application development scientist at Eastman. Steve. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia mentioned I'd like to switch focus now and talk more specifically about the methods used to evaluate the chemical resistance of candidate polymers, uh, including Eastman Triton copolyester and a competitive set of engineering resins. So first I'd like to speak a little bit about the fundamentals of chemical resistance. Uh, chemical resistance, as we're talking about it today, uh, is uh, specifically a chemical attack on the polymer that may catalyze uh, environmental stress cracking. Uh, this can accelerate uh, the environmental stress cracking quite a bit and significantly shorten the lifespan of the, the finished device. 
there are several factors that are associated with chemical attack uh, and reduced chemical resistance. Uh, chemical concentration and exposure time are the two um, biggest factors. Uh, this can reduce the energy required to disentangle the polymer, so you can think of it as either a solvation or a plasticization process. That can result in reduced rigidity, um, reduced clarity, uh, reduced modulus, and the suppression of glass transition temperature of the material, so it may not operate in the same uh, temperature range as it did before. And finally, uh, uh, dynamic fatigue under cyclic loading um, can be heightened and reduce the lifespan of the finished product uh, significantly. So in order to um, think about um, what we're talking about today, you know, the chemical resistance of triton copolyester versus uh, competitive resins such as uh, polycarbonate, um, I'd like to stop here for a second and just think a little bit about uh, triton copolyester. Um, Triton is a unique uh, polymer. It's uh, unique to Eastman. Uh, we're the only people in the world that uh, produce this chemistry. Um, it's a modification of basic uh, polyethylene terephthalate chemistry, basic PET chemistry. Uh, the three building blocks uh, are common to, uh, two of the three building blocks are common to PET. Uh, we start out with dimethyl terephthalate or DMT. Uh, that's one of the basic building blocks of PET. We modify that with cyclohexane dimethanol, uh, which you refer to as CHDM. A lot of other people produce uh, PET with ethylene glycol. We, we prefer the uh, cyclic uh, glycol. And then finally, we modify that further with the addition of a four-membered ring, um, a compound called um, tetramethyl cyclobutane diol or TMCD. So the combination of these three result in the Triton family of copolyesters. And what this does is actually take the underlying value proposition of copolyesters in, in being very, very clear and very tough and uh, chemically resistant, and it expands on the chemical resistance, the toughness, and it also puts us in an area of uh, temperature performance that's never seen before in a copolyester. So these materials have uh, glass transition temperatures above 100 degrees C, uh, which allows them to be uh, extremely hydrolytically stable and um, be very robust in moist um, environments. This is uh, this is very new in the in the realm of copolyesters. Um, it also leads to excellent biocompatibility um, and a unique set of um, sort of toughness properties, I'd like to say. Uh, toughness is a little harder to define. Um, a lot of people like to refer to notch size odd uh, for toughness. And our grades of Triton copolyester have no break notch size odds at both a quarter of an inch uh, thickness, that would be eighth of an inch, sorry, three millimeter, and also six millimeter, which would be a quarter of an inch thickness. Um, so basically, in the data that we're about to discuss, Shortly, uh, we take our Triton grades of copolyester and uh, the competitive resins in the consideration set, and we expose them um, using a modified ASDM D543 uh, test protocol. And we use the Instron Ceased 9050 reverse side impact tester to present you values that are uh, retention of physical properties post exposure to the chemical. And in this consideration set, we've evaluated uh, polycarbonate, Eastman Triton copolyester, and some impact modified styrenic materials. Uh, talk in a little more depth about the process itself uh, for this reverse side impact property testing. Uh, what we do is we take a fixed strain jig, uh, which would represent 1.5% strain on the material. We affix standard flex bars uh, to that uh, strain jig, and then we saturate a cotton pad, which is represented in the photograph on the upper right-hand side of the slide. We saturate a cotton pad uh, 
with the chemical of interest and we expose one side of this flex bar only uh, to that chemical for 24 hours under controlled conditions to uh, minimize the evaporation for things like isopropyl alcohol and more volatile compounds. And then finally, after 24 hours of exposure, the flex bars are removed from the jig, the uh, saturated pad is removed, and the any excess chemical on the on the outside face is uh, is wiped away, and they're evaluated in the in the Instron cease reverse side impact tester, uh, which is the the two photographs on the bottom left hand side of the slide. What this gives us is a um, residual uh, physical property in joules compared to uh, a control that is um, strained but not exposed to the chemical. So in the slide that uh, we're looking at now, if you look to the column to the far left hand side, that's our materials of interest uh, here are specifically Triton MX711, which is our standard flow grade, Triton MX731, uh, which is our high flow grade for the medical market, uh, a high flow grade of polycarbonate, a standard flow grade of polycarbonate, a lipid resistant grade of polycarbonate, and then some impact modified styrenic materials. And that uh, far left column is the control value uh, for the impact, the reverse side impact um, without exposure to the chemical. And then in, th in this consideration set, we're actually looking at the carrier solvents required uh, to administer oncology drugs to patients. And so most of these things aren't particularly water soluble and they're going to be delivered in, in some kind of aqueous media, usually through, through an IV, sometimes directly through injection. And the carrier solvents are very important to keep these potent drugs uh, suspended in that aqueous media. And so we started with uh, MCT oil or medium chain triglyceride oil, which is used in both oncology treatments and uh, enteral feeding solutions. We looked at the uh, entoposide carrier solvent, the sulfex carrier solvents, dimethyl acetamide DMAC, and dimethyl sulfoxide DMSO. Um, a lot of these, uh, especially the last two, DMAC and DMSO, are small molecules that are known to be uh, pretty good solvents for polymers. So you can understand the um, heightened awareness of the FDA warning about uh, some of these um, IV connectors actually dissolving in, in during treatment. Uh, we exposed all of these to the materials in the consideration set for the 24 hours. And then what's reported here uh, is actually the retained um, properties compared to the control. So as you can see, MX, uh, Triton MX711, our standard flow grade, is pretty robust against all these, including uh, DMSO in the entoposide carrier solvents. Um, has very good robustness against the MCT oil, uh, the bull sulfex carrier solvent. Um, whereas a lot of the other grades, uh, especially the polycarbonates, they actually tend to break on the jig. And what that means is that the chemical attack on them is severe enough that they don't survive the 24-hour exposure at the 1.5% strain. So they either crack or break immediately and there's no bar that's intact enough to be tested um, in the Instron cease reverse side impact tester. So we color code these um, just as kind of a quick reference and you'll notice that MX711 is the most robust in our color coding scheme of uh, greater than 80% retention is uh, green, greater than 60% is blue, and uh, less than 60% is is uh, is an orange, yellow orange color. Uh, that's uh, that's the danger zone in our opinion. Uh, and you'll notice that MX711 is quite robust. MX731 is not as robust, uh, but still does okay with DMSO. Whereas most of the competitive resins either break on the jig, so don't survive that initial 24 hours of exposure, or have residual properties that are extremely low. Uh, usually in the you know 10 to 20 percent range. So after we looked at the carrier solvents which are required uh, 
to make the oncology drugs um, useful in treatment, we looked at the oncology drugs themselves. And so we looked at um, what was at the time the most common, um, commonly wide, common and widely used oncology drugs. Uh, we got these uh, from the manufacturers um, of the devices that we were that we were working on uh, converting to uh, Triton copolyester. Um, we tested them under the same protocol uh, as we just discussed with the carrier solvents. And the consideration set we'll talk about here includes Taxol, which is an oncology drug used to treat uh, a wide variety of cancers, including breast, lung, bladder, prostate, and uh, other solid tumor cancers. Andromycin, which is an anthracycline antibiotic drug that's used in cancer chemotherapy and is most, uh, most widely used for hematological malignancies and carcinomas. We also looked at uh, cyclophosphamide, which is another chemotherapy drug used to treat cancers uh, and autoimmune disorders. Uh, Entoposide is an injection uh, that's used most widely for lung cancer, testicular cancer, and uh, several different types of sarcomas. We looked at uh, IFEX, uh, which is used to treat testicular brand, uh, breast and lung cancers. And then finally, methotrexate, which is an anti-metabolite and antifolate drug used to treat uh, cancer, autoimmune disorders, neoplastic diseases, severe psoriasis, and adult rheumatoid arthritis. So these drugs are, you know, very widely used. You can see that many of them have uh, multiple uses. So we compared the same uh, set of polymers. Again, Triton MX711, the standard flow grade, uh, 731 or high flow grade against the high flow grades of polycarbonate, uh, standard flow grades of polycarbonate and lipid resistant grades of polycarbonate. And you'll notice here that these being, uh, you know, more complex molecules that things fare a little better. Uh, overall. So again, if we look at MX711, uh, very good resistance to these uh, undiluted uh, oncology drugs. MX731, the, the high flow grade fares considerably better. Uh, the, one, the one exception is in Taxol, whereas uh, a lot of the other materials, especially the high flow grades of polycarbonate, uh, they don't fare as well. And uh, there are several examples here. So if you look at this standard flow grade of polycarbonate against uh, cyclophosphamide. Uh, there's actually some plasticization going on here, so that 114 percent of retained property actually means that that uh, is probably softening a little bit and uh, may represent a, a, a danger different than environmental stress cracking. Um, and then again, the impact modified styrenics uh, do not fare very well. Um, against most of the things in the, consider in the considerations set here, uh, the exceptions being the methotrexate and the cyclophosphamide. So I think this gives a pretty complete picture that uh, Triton copolyester is, is very robust, not only to the oncology drugs, but also to the oncology drug carrier solvents. Uh, and, you know, they, and they require uh, the use uh, of both in order to keep these things stabilized in an aqueous environment. So we attribute this um, to the reduced uh, residual stress levels in Triton copolyester. And we've done quite a bit of uh, fundamental work to characterize these stress levels and understand what's going on. So part of this, you'll notice that uh, when we talked about the chemical makeup of this molecule, is uh, it's not as um, saturated a molecule or um, I'm sorry, I should say not as aromatic a molecule as some of the other engineering resins that, uh, that we compete against. And so the lack of, of resonance in those uh, cyclic structures in the backbone give us, uh, give us a unique uh, flex modulus and a unique ability to actually mold in an injection molding process without inducing a lot of stress because it takes uh, it takes um, less energy um, to freeze our materials, and, and therefore the residual stress level, uh, because of that um, sort of slower freezing process and not uh, quenching into a very high induced stress level. Uh, and we can prove this uh, in a technique that um, a couple of colleagues 
of mine uh, wrote up a couple of years ago in an Antac paper uh, where we took molded tinsel bars and molded uh, flex bars, the same bars that we use in our uh, cease reverse side impact residual uh, property evaluations. And we did a technique that is called skiving. So what we did was take a flex, a flat flex bar, uh, which most people overall uh, think has no residual stress because it has no curvature. And as you skive away very, very thin layers, what you'll notice is that bar actually starts to curve as uh, the residual stresses that are in the bar are, are released. And so if you do this very carefully, and if you look at the graph in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, what you'll notice is that the curvature, the deformation of these bars as they're skived go thinner and thinner for polycarbonate here is considerably higher than, than the curvature that's induced by this process uh, for trite. And this is a, this is a well-known, well-understood uh, mechanism for stress relief in polymers. Uh, it's been around for about 60 years, and, and the result of this is that uh, Triton has significantly less residual stress, anywhere between 20 and 50 percent lower than polycarbonate uh, measured under these conditions. And we've also considered, we've also looked at this for acrylics, impact modified styrenix, ABS, PCABS, uh, many grades, um, and you'll see the same result. Actually, with PCABS, uh, we have uh, probably 50 to 60 percent uh, less stress. And, Part of that's just the uh, just the nature of a blend. So I'd like to take a second now just to summarize the chemical resistance as we've talked about in the second half of this presentation. So if we're looking at um, chemical resistance in terms of residual stress, toughness, uh, chemical compatibility under stress, and then finally uh, a ranking for overall chemical resistance. Uh, for Eastman Triton Co-Polyester, uh, we would rate it as the highest performing, um, and that's due to low residual stress, due to the low low modulus and uh, longer cooling window, uh, higher toughness. Um, all the materials that you saw in this consideration said all the numbers that came out of those were actually ductile failures. That means that the bar was um, changed in shape but didn't actually crack or break or as you'll see in the impact modified styrenics all those failures were brittle failures so the bar actually broke into multiple pieces resulting in shards uh, not a good situation in a hospital and then chemical resistance compatibility under stress again Triton rates the highest uh, um, due to if not breaking under any of the disinfectants that we've looked at, carrier solvents or oncology chemicals. And then polycarbonate would be rated uh, medium. It has higher stress due to higher modulus and uh, faster freezing time and stress induced in the melting process. Uh, also, most of the failures you saw with the polycarbonate grade were ductile failures. That's, uh, there's an important caveat there. That's if they survived uh, exposure to a lot of the Carrier solvents actually all broke on the jig. Uh, so the ones that we could test with the oncology drugs themselves, undiluted oncology drugs, uh, any failure, well, there was actually a ductile failure. And then chemical compatibility under stress, this is where things uh, get more complex with polycarbonate. So the standard grades um, failed with uh, MCT oil, the Bulsoflex carrier solvent, uh, many, many disinfectants and wipes as well as taxol and topicide. And the high flow grade is even more susceptible. So that gives polycarbonate an overall uh, grade or ranking of medium. And then the impact modified styrenics, um, we would rank as low. Um, the residual stress is we're still um, still trying to quantify that, um, but we definitely believe it's higher than the Triton co-polyester. It has low toughness uh, due to the impact modification, a low elongation to break, and um, again, it fails uh, in a brittle manner. And then it didn't enjoy the interaction with uh, many of the carrier solvents and the drugs in the uh, oncology drugs themselves. So we give that an overall ranking of low. So I think, you know, this is a, a fairly, if, uh, if not concise, but a good overall view of uh, 
the chemical resistance of triton called polyester to compare to engineering resins that we compete against in the medical space. Um, and then finally, I'd like to share just a few examples of uh, applications that we're actually in in these spaces. So in fluid management components, um, you know, wide acceptance of male and female lures, Y sites, manifolds. Uh, this is largely due to chemical resistance. Again, good resistance to lipids, which was not really talked about here, uh, but oncology drugs and their carriers, disinfectants, and then uh, you know, overall reduced cracking rates uh, for a heightened sense of safety, uh, very high bond strength to tubing, uh, no chemicals of concern, so it's BPA, BPS, halogen-free, no plasticizers, uh, no phthalates, uh, excellent clarity and color retention even after um, sterilization through either uh, ethylene oxide, E-beam, or gamma sterilization and then outstanding durability and toughness. And then in blood contact devices, uh, there's a lot of cardiac devices, uh, centrifuges, filters, reservoirs. Again, this is due to it being BPA, BPS-free, um, you know, no halogens, no materials of concern. Uh, we're putting together a data package that uh, is pretty convincing that Triton has a reduced fiber energy absorption on the surface, so if you're thinking about a blood contact device, something like the blood oxygenator in the, the left side of that, those pictures, uh, reduced clotting in that space is, is very important, and that fiber energy absorption on the surface is the first step to clotting. Uh, reduced, spec, uh, reduced scrap rates here because of black, spe black specks or cracking or breakage. Uh, Copolyesters don't tend to char so there's a lot, a lot less uh, black spec contamination, which can be a, a big issue with a lot of the other um, engineering resins, including polycarbonate and acrylics. Excellent chemical resistance, again, good solvent bonding, excellent resistance to chemical disinfectants in these larger parts. Uh, good chemical resistance to most plasticizers. And then finally, in these larger parts, there's no annealing required because, again, of that low residual stress state uh, because of the, the lower modules. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, uh, turn you back over to Trey, and then uh, we'll entertain any questions you may have. All right, Steve, thank you so much for that, and also thank you to Cynthia. We've had a really great informative presentation thus far. Well, we give these guys just a little bit to look over the questions. We did want to encourage you guys to submit us your questions. We do have the question box on the right-hand side of the screen. We've got some great uh, technical experts on the line, so we do encourage you to send us your questions. Use that question box on the right-hand side of the screen. We did see a couple of questions come in asking things like, you know, a copy of the slides, where can I see a copy of the recorded presentation? We will be sending you guys an email within the coming days, so to be checking that, and that will have a link to the recorded presentation and the video, as well as the slides. You guys can watch that again at your leisure, and then also share that with others at your company. But uh, yeah, we do have a lot of great questions that have already come in, so I'd like to turn it back over to, uh, to Steve and Cynthia, and we can get the question and answer period kicked off. So for the, for the first question uh, re uh, regarding uh, chemical resistance to other uh, chemicals. We have a we have reams of data that we'll be happy to share with you. We just need you know contact information. Uh, we test this against uh, any chemical of concern that any of our customers have, and any chemical that's of interest to us. So we look at uh, disinfectants. Uh, we look at common things like uh, say hydrogen peroxide and bleaches and different alcohols. Um, so we have a a tremendous amount of chemical resistance we can share. Uh, you know, I would suggest that you narrow it down to more what you're interested in, otherwise you could be swamped. Uh, we also do testing for common food things. Uh, that's another big uh, important market for us. Uh, there's another question around uh, can we correlate data from the ASTM D543 method to real lifespan of final products? That's a little tougher. Uh, we do that when we can get final products to test, which is not often the case. Uh, the challenge there often is stressing that uh, final product uh, to the level that you want to stress it to. You know, oftentimes uh, the nice thing about a 
tensile bar or a flex bar is you have a nice device like an Instron or an MTS tester that's designed to break specifically those, whereas you get a complex housing, say like the surface of an ambulatory infusion pump, it's a little more difficult. But we do do that testing. Um, we try to give customers our best guidelines possible as far as lifespan. And what, what, what I can say is a blanket statement is that we've always found that uh, under a chemical attack um, from a disinfectant or, a, you know, a common small molecule used to wipe these things down, some sort of cleaning product, we've always seen a, an expansion of lifespan uh, with Triton copolyester. And then I have, uh, I have a third question here. Is Triton resin amorphous? Does it have similar shrinkage to PC so that it can be used in existing tools? The answer to both of those is yes. Uh, Triton in all its forms is 100% uh, amorphous resin, so there's no propensity at all to crystallize. It has a very uniform shrink rate because of that, and the shrink rate is the exact same as polycarbonate. So uh, a lot of the business that we enjoy is actually um, due to that, and it allows our customers to usually with uh, very low uh, modification or no modification of their tools uh, to run track. Okay, there's a question, does the main chemical attack, uh, is it due to high or low pH or specific materials that are found in a disinfecting material? So uh, the answer to that question is uh, it's more of the components of the disinfecting materials. Uh, change in pH is, is not, not an issue for Triton copolyester. There are some susceptibilities to more acid or more basic pHs for other materials. Uh, Triton's pretty neutral in that aspect, but it's specific components like uh, things like quaternary ammonium salts. Uh, quaternary ammoniums are especially aggressive toward anything that has uh, base chemistry like polycarbonate. Um, so that can be that can be very challenging in a lot of this segment. Uh, whereas Triton has very good dis has a very good chemical resistance to all those disinfectants. How do we make a amorphous plastic more resistant to chemicals? So that's an interesting question. So historically, what we have been taught is that if you need high chemical resistance, you need a crystalline polymer. And that's true. Uh, crystalline polymers are are very resistant to chemicals, and so when you think about nylons, which are semi-crystalline, uh, bordering on what you know people would consider crystalline, they have excellent chemical resistance. The chemical resistance for a Triton copolyester comes from its amorphous nature and the fact that it has very very low residual stress. So after you mold the polymer, after you melt it, after you've induced a couple of melt histories in this polymer it still has very, very low stress, and most uh, environmental stress cracking is actually uh, the reduction or release of built-in built residual stresses. And so the fact that we produce very, very little stress with this material is what gives it the excellent chemical resistance. That, and there's also a chemical component, because this is kind of unique chemistry, you know, based on six-membered and four-membered rings, uh, that are largely um, um, aliphatic in nature rather than ar aromatic uh, gives it also excellent chemical resistance to a lot of things that you know may be aromatic in nature. So the major polyol, that's an excellent question, um, and that's something that we would that's something that we don't openly discuss. So we, we'll give you sort of the great, you know, we'll give you the overall um, overall chemical structure, but, you know, it's a trade secret to exactly how we make this molecule. So I apologize, but I can't, can't entertain that question. Okay, so there's a, there's a question uh, around... Um, how would you work with us if we need several other types of drugs tested with your plastic? So that's actually pretty simple. So basically, uh, if you're interested in, in our material and you're interested in any chemical that you're concerned about, 
uh, it's just as simple as uh, you know contacting Eastman. Let us know your what you're interested in, and you know we'll be happy as part of the laboratory that I'm part of. Uh, that's part of my job is ongoing chemical resistance studies. So uh, my colleague UBL Lou and I do this routinely. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, especially if um, if if it's a drug that's uh, common outside the United States. Uh, you would you would probably need to provide us with a drug, and uh, or the chemical concern. We'd be happy to we'd be happy to do that for you. Resistance. Uh, so there's a question about uh, do we have information about the resistance of Triton uh, by gamma radiation? And yes, we do. We have uh, we have a, a separate presentation that we can share with you. So. Um, Triton being uh, totally amorphous and largely aliphatic in its, in its backbone uh, doesn't suffer any kind of degradation or color shift by gamma radiation. It's extremely stable, and you'll see uh, we've tested up to 100 kilogram or 100 kilogram uh, doses, and we don't see any reduction in um, impact uh, after chemical exposure. We don't see any color shift. So, if you're interested, we can we can share that presentation with you. And then there's a question, what makes the material less prone to residual stress? Isn't that a process-driven characteristic? And you're correct. There are uh, process-driven things here. So you can take any material and mold it in a way that it doesn't like. And you can take any material and you can mold it uh, under ideal conditions. And so for the consideration set that we've shown you here, all these are molded under the manufacturer's best um, best processing condition. And so what allows Triton to have better chemical resistance and lower residual stress is that unique flex modulus. So if you'll look, if you'll, if you'll take a few seconds and look at, say, a data sheet for Triton called polyester, what you'll notice is that the flex modulus um, is about a third lower than a lot of the more rigid um, engineering polymers that we compete against. And that, uh, no matter how you mold it, even if you mold it poorly, it's going to come out with lower residual stress just because that molecule has the ability um, to naturally uh, reduce some of that stress in the molding process, no matter how you mold it. Um, so there's a question, is Triton moisture sensitive as far as drying and processing? So the answer to that is definitely yes. This is a condensation polymer. And so when you when you build molecular weight here, uh, just like a lot of the engineering resins that, that you, you probably also work with, you give off uh, moisture. And if you reintroduce moisture, uh, you can drive the molecular weight back down. And so Triton does need to be dried uh, because it has a high TG. Uh, it is fairly easy to dry. We suggest about four hours at uh, 190 degrees F or 88 degrees C. Uh, which is, you know, fairly mild, and uh, we give you, we can give you very specific guidelines on how to dry the material, and very specific guidelines on what level of residual moisture you have that you'll need to actually mold your part with. Um, there's a question: Which uh, quaternary ammoniums have you used in your testing? And and the the answer is we've used all of them that are commercially available to this point. So we have, as far as the uh, overall um, combinations in that are sold as uh, disinfectants on the market, we've tested Santa Cloth AF3, Santa Cloth HB, Virex TB, and then 3M Neutral Quant uh, as the sold as the as sold package to the market. We've also tested the individual partner ammonium uh, chlorides themselves. That's also information that we can share with you. Uh, is there any recommendation for solvents for joining with PVC and non-PVC tubing? So we have, uh, again, we have guidance around all that. Usually what we suggest is um, uh, methyl ethyl ketone, MEK. You can also use uh, cyclohexanone, uh, both of which work very well with the PVC and a non-PVC tubing. Uh, there's a, there are also other uh, other things that can use right off the top of my head. That's the two that I remember the most uh, 
most widely uh, available and um, give tubing strengths uh, to the point where the tubing actually breaks rather than the bond itself. I have another question here. How bad is the chemical compatibility issue with connectors outside of the U.S. and Europe? And that's, uh, that's an interesting question. It's evolving. Uh, we, have, we have snippets and uh, that's, there's a, you know, there's a lot of uh, interest in this material in China and there's, a, there's been several issues uh, in China and in, um, in, in the Asia Pacific region itself. We don't have anything specific like an FDA warning that's come out of China, but uh, there is an issue, you know, outside of China. Things are done outside of the U.S. and Europe and in China and Asia Pacific. Things are done slightly differently there. Um, disinfection protocols are slightly different. The disinfectants they use are definitely different, and they tend to be uh, a little more aggressive than the disinfectants used in, used in the U.S. and Europe. Steve, it looks like uh, we have time for about one more question, unless you have any closing thoughts you'd like to impart us. Yeah, so, I mean, overall, I think, uh, you know, the presentation, the takeaway from the presentation is that Triton is, is new to the uh, medical market. It's only been around for, you know, around six years now. Uh, we're making tremendous inroads. Um, it's a resin that you should definitely think about. It's a resin you should definitely try. We have a lot of resources to help you here at Eastman. There's application development folks like myself. There's tech service uh, around the world. So when you go to actually mold this resin uh, and it's new to you, we'll actually have a human that will stand beside the machine with you until you solve your issues. And we also have uh, design service engineers here who will help you look at part and uh, tooling designs. Uh, we can suggest modifications uh, to both. We can suggest, uh, you know, the best process possible. And it's not ever that we're experts in what you're doing, but we're experts in our material. So most people can figure it out, uh, you know, 90% of the way, but that last 10% can be quite challenging and, and quite frustrating. And, and we're the guys that have all that knowledge. So we can help you get over that last 10%, often that last hurdle to, uh, you know, to make a finished product. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, that's a business model that's fairly unique to Eastman. Uh, we're still very proud of that, and uh, I would suggest that, uh, you know, you make us earn our pay. All right, Steve. Well, thank you so much, and a big thank you to, uh, to Cynthia as well. We also wanted to encourage you guys to check out the other Eastman webinars that we do have on the Prospector Knowledge Center. You can search by company there. A lot of great and informative webinars uh, we had the pleasure of doing with Eastman in the past. Uh, again, just wanted to remind you guys we are recording today's session and we'll send you a link by email when the slides and video have been posted to the Prospector Knowledge Center. But again, thank you everybody for attending and have a great rest of the day.